comes from God. I mean, love is an unexplainable thing. You can't hold love in your hand. You can't put it up on a shelf someplace and say, there's love. Love is something that's spiritual. It comes into the inner part of man, the woman. No way forced to know that except that we must remember that it comes from God. That's why that godly love is so effective. The world thinks they love, but it becomes a one-night stand. Right. But when God loves through you, in your marriage, in your church, in your home, in your environment, that kind of love lasts. Amen. Praise the Lord. Can you say a good amen? Amen. 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 It's so nice to have all of you with us. Brother Trifiatis, doing a wonderful ministry with the homeless people in Morgantown and and uh, we're very, very happy with our brother and his wife and their ministry and their family there. This coming Saturday, the 19th of September, he needs two or three people to help in his service over in Morgantown. I know there are people that like to do these things. And uh, you'll find there's a lot of gratification in working in that service over there. He fills that church basement Sometimes 300 homeless people feeds them all, preaches to them, sings to them, shares love with them, and it just goes on and on and on. If you want to be blessed, Brother Trefiati, just raise your hand. You may not want to stand. He never wants to stand. Just raise your hand, Brother. Here I'm God with a silver hair. <laughs> Brother Trefiati, uh, he's with us, uh, part of our church. We, we love him and his family as well as we do all our families. And, but you see Brother Trifiotis, Brother George, going out of church and telling him, yes, I'd like to be there. Tell me how to get there and what time it is. And I'm sure that God will richly bless you. I'm going to be preaching again for him one of these Saturdays when I don't have a wedding or something else. And I'd rather much preach the word than hang it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> So nice to have all of you with us, Brother Barris and his wife, wonderful people. And uh, I'll never, never forget the graciousness of which he showed to me as a young preacher coming here, having been in the ministry many years more than I. And yet he showed me all the respect and all the love that a man could possibly show. And uh, I'll never forget that as long as I live. And we love you folks very much, and we're very proud to have you back with us. Previous pastor of this church before I came. Uh, you lost him, you got me. <laughs> but anyway, back to the word. It's good to be with you this morning. If you have your Bibles, I have two texts I want to read to you. First of all, Revelation chapter 20. Both of my texts are found in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 20, beginning with verse 11. Thank you. Thank you. I've been working on so many furnaces that I forgot what a mic is. There we go. It has an awful one that I remember. <laughs> Revelation chapter 20, and then we're going to go back to Revelation chapter 3. These are our two passages of text this morning. If I was to use a theme today, I would like to use these words. Is your name written there? Is your name written there? Ladies and gentlemen, for personal revival, and I've been preaching on that, and I'm going to preach on it in one way or another until the Lord tells me to stop. I believe the first priority in every individual's life is to know that their name is written in the Lamb's book. Amen. Amen. To know how can I know, Pastor? You will know today. You must know. You can't go on your values. You can't go on your 
standard of living. You can't go on the good deeds you do in your community. Your name must be written there. And for personal revival, for the move of God in our individual lives, we have to first be one of His. Amen. You've got to be one of His before God can move in you and through you. Notice Revelation chapter 20. You know, it's ironic as I get into this this morning that the Bible has a lot to say about this book. Notice what it says, Revelation chapter 20. Verse 11. I got little things stuck all over the place here. So bear with me. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was found no place for them. And I saw the dead. Now, this scripture specifically talking about the dead. Small and great stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open. Which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. I've had questions asked me. I said, where do people go? I had it asked me two weeks ago. Where do people go when they die? Is there a place of limbo? Is there a place where they just go and, and they wait for the final judgment? If, this, if you read this scripture, you'll find that if a person dies unsaved, they immediately go to heaven. If a person dies saved and redeemed, they immediately go to the presence of God. There is no place of limbo. You can't pay to have somebody prayed out of purgatory. Forgive me. When you die, mister, you're going to face your final abode immediately. That's what this scripture said. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were all judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now listen to this. Verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Stephen wrote something that really impressed me. An awful picture is unfolded here before our heart's imagination. It is the arraignment of the unregenerate dead of all the race for their final judgment. That means from the very beginning of God's creation. Everybody that died disbelieving in God. In view of the setting of the judgment scene, verse 11, the situation of the impenitent of all ages is unspeakably terrifying. We know how bravery flees from a sinner's breast here and now when the sense of the divine presence in authority and power is for a little while manifested. To face God in death is more fearful to the unforgiven. But what, what will it be for him to meet the flaming eye of holy omniscience? The books of God's perfect remembrance 
will unfold the sinner's entire biography of impenitence, resistance, and unbelief toward God, His Maker, and Jesus Christ, His Redeemer. Let alone the dead, the Bible speaks the living impenitence will quail before the wrathful Lamb at His reappearing on earth. Here's what it says. Fall on us. Hide us from the face of Him that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. This is the time of the tribulation. For the great day of His wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Thinkest thou this, O man, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Thou who after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, unto those that do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul that doeth evil. The sentence of the great white throne is inevitable to those who die, who live without God. King James, the, the uh, modern King James Version says an important correction you will, of the translation in verse 13. Instead of reading, they were judged every man according to their works. They have wrote it and they were condemned each in accordance with his acts. You see, ladies and gentlemen, there's going to be degrees of punishment. I know that it's a hard thing for us to accept. And I can understand when people come to me and say, Pastor, I don't understand. How can somebody go to hell when they never heard about Jesus? How can they, how can they lose their place in heaven if they never had a chance? Because you see, folks, God can't go back on His Word. God cannot go back on His righteous judgment. And the Bible makes it very clear that no sin, absolutely no sin unforgiven, no sin at all, can enter heaven. None! Well, that's, you might feel, and I've often thought about this as a pastor, that seems unfair. But you see, that's because of the curse. If Adam and Eve had never decided to sin and destroy the beauty of God's original creation, there would have never been a curse upon mankind. But because of that, innocent people lose as well as those who are not innocent. It's the same way in war. Innocent people die right along with those who are not innocent. It's because of the pains and the effect of what happens in that situation. And God has made a decree that only those who are pure, only those who have been washed in the blood, We'll go to heaven. Nobody else. But this scripture tells us there will be degrees. That's why they'll be judged according to their works. If they're unsaved, they'll go to hell. But I believe there's going to be people that will burn hotter than others. I believe there are people who have stood in pulpits and preached the word of God and lived like hell, forgive me, out in the world while they stood there and gave the, the wonderful word of God. They will burn hot. Yes. While other people's punishment will be less. Although they will be eternally punished because they never <coughs> was redeemed from the curse. 
You get what I'm saying? You got to. If you don't get this, then you're missing it. Because there is no second chance. God doesn't make any favorites. He doesn't say because his name's that or her name's that or because they come from Israel or they come from the United States that I'm going to make provision for them. Or if they come from Africa back in the middle of nowhere where nobody's ever been there. The Bible says I cannot. Jesus said I am the same yesterday, today, and forever, God said. And he said I don't change. He's no respecter of persons. That means he's made a decree. He's made a law. And he must stand by that law. That's what's wrong with our churches today. We've made, we've made our standards according to the law of God, and now we've changed them. <laughs> Isn't that right? We've changed our standards. The law of God hasn't changed. We've changed them. And thus the standard no longer holds true. But you see, my God doesn't make mistakes. So He's already decreed that, and He will stand by it. Can you say a good amen? Amen. amen. You see, it's your name written there. I've been to church for 20 years, Pastor. I've never been there for 50 years. If your name's not written there, and you die today, you're going to hell. That's the word of God. Turn with me back to Revelation chapter 3, please. <laughs> You might ask the question this morning, how can I know my name's written there? I'll be explaining that to you. I'll be explaining that to you. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write these things, saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful. He's talking to a church here. You know that, don't you? He's talking to a church here. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast. And repent. That means change. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast few names in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Mark that. For they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Again, I remind you of the washing of the blood. And I will not blot out his name. Here it is. I will not blot out his name. Out of the book of life. Now can I stop a moment? God forgive me please. But I'm going to say this. Those people that believe in eternal security. I want you to know that scripture right there blows that doctrine away. It blows it away. The Bible says that if he so deems he can blot your name out of that book. But the eternal secure to say once you have accepted Christ as your personal Savior you can never be condemned. That's not true. You say, then what I have to live for, Pastor, I'll tell you what you have to live for. you got to live every day as though Jesus was coming. Yes. you got to live as though He was going to enter into this world right today. The imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't put dates on His coming because I want to be ready today. Amen. And it would be fine with me if He came. Amen. I would not pay taxes, don't you, sir? A lot of things I wouldn't have to do. Let the Antichrist take care of gathering them in. Verse 3. Amen. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. Verse 4. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, there it is, which have not defied. Listen. I will not, verse 5, I will not blot out the name of that person out of the book of life that his garments are white, but I will confess his name before my Father and before 
his angels. Father, bless your word. Make it real our heart today. I pray, Lord, before this service is up, that every single man, every single woman, every single teenager, every college student, every young person will know their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Jesus, let there be no doubt in our hearts that today we're redeemed. Hallelujah. Say to the arrows. Hallelujah. Anoint me, Jesus. Humbly, I know I'm not worthy to be here. I pray that your blood would cleanse my mind and my body. I have sinned against you. Forgive me, Jesus. Help me to be worthy to give you the prayer. <coughs> In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Kendall wrote, The book of life is where the names of all believers are registered. It symbolizes God's knowledge of who belongs to Him. Clothed in white means set apart for God and made pure. Christ promises future honor and eternal life to those who stand firm in their faith. They will be guaranteed. Now, you hear this. Who stand firm in their faith. They will be guaranteed a listing in the book of life and introduced to the hosts of heaven as ones who belong to Jesus. I'm looking for that day. Can you sing it with me? Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Shall be found written 
in the book. Way back in the Old Testament. You can find it clear back in the book of Exodus. Is your name written in the book? It says in the book of Exodus. This premise is forever. God has made a distinction, ladies and gentlemen. No wonder preachers that want to see their churches be righteous and holy before God are beginning to preach the importance of letting sin alone and walking in the righteousness of God. If we don't do it, ladies and gentlemen, we won't have entrance into heaven. If I read my Bible correctly, I don't care how many doctrines there are. And what I'm preaching to you is not necessarily the doctrines of the assemblies of God, although it is. I believe it's the doctrine of the Bible. I believe it's what the Word says. You can't distort that. You can't dissect that. You can't rip that apart. It says it. It's established. That's the way it is. And if we want to go to heaven, we better straighten out. Amen. Fly right. Yeah. Wings of love. I'm sort of referring to that song there. Fly right, Mr. My mother used to tell me. She picked the strap up. Mr. You call down and fly right. Or I'm going to give you something to fly about. <laughs> God wants us to straighten up. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's old mama's talk there. But that's, that's, I, I think he's our father. Can you say that? He's our father. He treats me like his child. He loves me like his children. And he wants us to walk uprightly before him. And if he has to flog us a little, in the process he will, to get us straightened out. I still believe that too. People say, oh, if you're going through hardships, you're not living for God. Baloney, you can be living close to God, and God still allows hardships. Why? To teach us how to obey. Amen. To teach us how to walk righteously. Every time we go through a hardship, if we handle that thing correctly, God honors that. He makes us grow in Him in faith and in maturity. So don't look at your problem today as though God's forgotten you. God's never going to leave you. If you're a believer, He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. He's walking right with you right now. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad today. Come down and read. Praise God. Thank God I could read on in Daniel, but we're not going to do it for time's sake. Ladies and gentlemen, today God keeps records. I don't know whether you believe that or not, but God keeps records. Everywhere I look in the Word of God, it tells me that God has record books. He keeps records. Probably God has His own library of resource concerning all that has ever happened concerning man's eternal state. Man's rebellion. Every time we rebel against God, it's written down. Man's sin. Every time we've sinned, and it's not repented of. I want you to hear it. I believe when the blood washes away sin, it cleanses the page too. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Boy, that sentence chills up and down my spine to know that nothing is held against me. It cleanses the book. See, I wish I could go back and do 20 years ago what I know now. If you're saved, don't worry about it. It's under the blood. It's forgotten as far as the east is from the west. It's been blotted out of that page. It's blotted out of that page. It's blotted out of that page. And we got a new start. Jesus Christ. God, turned over a new leaf. Hallelujah. Get to start all over again. How many times do people get to do that? Right? Very seldom. But when you get saved, you get to start all over again. Hallelujah. I like that. Glory to God. I can almost dance up here, but I won't do it for fear of somebody getting scared. That's West Virginia for scared. I believe it's record books. Keeps records of man's words. Every word spoken is recorded. His record books keeps records of our deeds. Everything we've done. I want you to know 
that I have given $500 this year to the needy. I want you to know, put it in the newspaper so that everyone in Greene County knows that this man is getting. Brother, when you give that way, God writes it down. Yeah, right. If you happen to pull them bills out all year long and you slip them to somebody and never say a word about it, just say, God bless you. God writes that down too. How many believe that? Let me tell you something. It's there. I believe there's a graciousness in living for God and giving of ourselves. Thank God, I don't have to worry about being about being publicized down here. In fact, I really don't like it. I don't take good pictures. My head's getting opener, and and, uh, and my hair's getting brighter, and, and my eyes are getting dimmer, and my mouth is getting emptier. And all these things are happening to me. I don't like to have pictures taken of this Sunday school thing. That man called me on the phone and said, Reverend, I want you to send me a picture of yourself. I said, oh, Lord. I said, me, send you a picture. I said, nobody would ever read it. If you opened that thing up and saw that thing glaring at you, you'd say, oh, there's another quack. <laughs> send me all the things you've done in your ministry. I said, brother. If I sent you all the things I've done in the ministry, you wouldn't have room in your newspaper to all the mistakes that I've made. What I'll do is, let's just do it this way. I'll send you the nearest picture I got. You take it and say, we're going down to the other end of the county. And we're going to worship together with this fellow on this picture. Man's prayer. Every time you pray, it's going to be recorded. I want you to know, Pastor, I pray an hour every day. How glad are you when that hour is up? Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God! When that hour is up. I believe that kind of prayer will be recorded. And then there's prayer when you let me lose myself and find it, Lord. You know what I'm saying? I don't know the rest of the words. Do you know that or hear it not? You don't want to sing it through, do you? You act like you've got to do one. Yeah, it is getting close. Um, how do we pray? It's going to be recorded if you lose yourself in your prayer time. You find yourself in the presence of God, and when you get up, you know you've touched the throne. You've touched the throne. All these things are going to be recorded. Every one of them is going to be recorded. Today, ladies and gentlemen, let's deal with just one of these records. Just one. Very briefly. Matthew Henry wrote these words. The utter destruction of the devil's kingdom leads to an account of the day of judgment. This will be a great day. The great day when all shall appear before the throne. Before the throne. Great and white. Very glorious and perfectly just and righteous. All those who have died in their sins, they will be resurrected. The judge... The Lord Jesus Christ will judge. The earth and the heaven flee from His face. There is no place found for them. The persons to be judged, verse 12, none are so mean, but they have some talents to account for. None so great as to avoid the jurisdiction of this court. Not only those that are found alive at His coming, but all those who have died before the rule of judgment settled. The books were opened. The book of God's omniscience. There it is again. And the book of the sinner's conscience. And another book shall be opened. The book of the scriptures. I often wonder, what is this book of life? And as I begin to study, I find that there is one book of life. 
It's referred to in the scripture many times. But if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, you have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. This is a book of life. Right there. And I believe that book is going to contain the holy rule of God. And when he opens that book of life, he is going to go down this holy rule. And he's going to judge according to his word. That's the rule. That's the rule. And if it doesn't conform with the word, it'll be cast out. You see, Jesus even said, some of you will come and say, I've cast out demons. I've healed the sick. I've preached to multitudes. As the Bible say, he'll say, hey, Heart for me, you work for me. I never knew you. I never wondered why. Because after being judged by that guideline, they did not measure up. Pretty stiff. That's why God can't change his mind. You see? That's why God can't change his mind, even at the judgment seat. Because he judges by his word. And the Bible says that's forever settled in heaven. We must finish. This thing is so big to me. I've asked the Lord since I've been working on this sermon this week. Lord is my name written there. Pastor, you certainly ought to know that. I do. But I'll tell you folks, it is so important to me that I know that my name is there. That I know it's there. I give you four ethics quickly about the book of record here. Number one, I want you to notice the ethics concerning the benefactors of this record. The ethics concerning the benefactors of this record of the book of life. Turn with me to Luke chapter 10 and verse 20. All born again believers, listen to me. All born again believers have their name written therein. Luke 10 20. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not. Notice it. That the spirits are subject unto you. Even preachers can get big head. Even ministries can get self exalted. Notice this. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you. But rather, if you want to rejoice, Rejoice because your names are written. <coughs> Can you say amen? amen? Brother, that to me is a priority. Yes. Even above all the things that we do in the name of Jesus. Right. This is a priority. Amen. Turn over with me if you would. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 19. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.19 Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Boy, that's a big scripture. It says that God knows me, that I'm His. He has jointly agreed that I belong to Him. I'm part of the family of God. But that doesn't stop there. See, our society has said, as long as your name is written there, don't worry about it. You just go out if you make a mistake, and we're all going to make mistakes, folks. And I think if I could only balance this to where I don't go too far on either side. If I was to stand here and tell you, you're never going to make a mistake in life, you must live perfect, I'd be wrong. Because I know we're human and that we're not perfect. We're striving for perfection. We're not perfect. 
The Bible says that if your name's written there, that you cease from iniquity. Don't do it no more. That's simply it. Just don't partake of it anymore. It's over. Our society needs to hear this. Do you know you're born again? Do you know your name's written there? I was working on a man's furnace this past week, Mr. Hauser. I bought a TV from him how many years ago? 120? 20 years ago. Nice guy. Both were saved. Loved the Lord. About six months ago, his wife had bypass surgery in Winchester Memorial Hospital in Winchester, Virginia. And after the surgery, she came home and she began to develop more heart and chest pains and stuff. And they had to take her back to the hospital. She stayed in there another two weeks. And she came home just a matter of two weeks before I went down. Just now. And he says... Things just didn't go too good. She didn't act like she was doing well. And he says, he said, Fred, about, about nine days ago, she, she was calling Daddy. She said, Daddy, come in here. Come in here. To the bed. So he came in and sat out on the bed beside her. She said, Daddy, she said, would you pray for me? Did you lay hands on me and pray for me? He said, sure, I will. He said, she said, would you pray for me that if Jesus, ask Jesus, that if he wants to heal me, that he heal me now. Right here. Right now. But if he wants to take me home, that he take me. I want his will and his purpose. He said, honey, you're asking me to do something that hurts me. Not going to heaven, but he said, I don't want to lose you. What do you think I'm supposed to do here? She said, would you do it, Dad? So he knelt down beside the bed and laid his hands on her forehead. And he told me this as I was back in my truck to him after I worked on his furnace. He said, I got a testimony for you, friend. He said, I laid hands on her. I said, Jesus, you know her name is written in the Lamb's book of God. If you choose to heal her, heal her now. But if not, receive her spirit into my presence. He was through praying. She had asked for a cup of tea and he went out into the kitchen and was making tea. He said, Fred, it could have been 15 minutes. And he said, I heard her say, Daddy, come help me. He said, I So he left the, the water and he went back in, helped her up. Sit on the bed. And he did. He said, Honey, are you feeling bad? Are you hurting? And she looked at me in the eyes and she says, Honey, Daddy, I've never felt better in my life. My Jesus has just called for me to come home. And she slumped over the dead. What a way to go for her. Something to know where you're going when you die. To know. I made up my mind I was going to share that testimony with you this morning. And he tells everybody he meets. He tells everybody, my wife is with Jesus. And it isn't going to be long. He just kept telling me over and over again, it won't be long, Fred, until I'm going to be making that flight. And I'm going to be with her. And we're going to together be with Jesus forever and ever. Why? Because there was a solution there. She knew she was saved. Amen. There is no fear where there is no doubt. Amen. Am I correct, folks? Right. Number two, I want you to notice not only the benefactors of this record, but I want you to notice the hope of this record. <coughs> Tremendous hope. The hope of this record. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 5, please. Verse 13. Yes, we have a hope. Here's what it says. 1 John 5, 13. 
These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Billy Graham, one of my fine preachers. I just love him. I believe that he has preached a solid message for years and years. And I hold him in such high respect for the ministry of salvation that he has preached <coughs> over the years. He said this, The Bible teaches that Christ cleanses the conscience. The Bible says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? To have a guilty conscience cleansed and to be free from its constant accusation is an experience from God. It is not the cleansing of the conscience that saves you. It is the faith in Jesus Christ that saves. And a cleansing conscience is the result of having come into the right relationship with God. If you're here this morning and your conscience is bothering you, and you're not right. That's a pointed statement. It's true. Because I believe when a person's name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that their conscience becomes washed. And their past is under the blood. And they've made themselves right with God. You may, you may do things once in a while that you have to repent for. But your past is under the blood. And your conscience is clear. Have you heard anybody say that? My conscience is clear. Is yours? If Jesus comes this second, are you ready? Do you know your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Do you know that if He would come this second, I mean in the next second, you're going to go without a doubt. Revelation chapter 19, verse 8. I won't wait for you to find it. And to her was granted that she should talk about the church, that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Thank God. Hallelujah. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. I believe with all my heart today, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to know the assurance that your name is written there. Pastor, I've got a long way to go. I'm trying to learn about the Word of God. I'm trying to learn about doctrine. I'm just trying to learn about your church. I, I'm having a, I, I need time. I need time. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. Get one thing clear in your mind. If you're here and you're and just this, this church is new to you even. Listen to this. It doesn't matter about this church, whether it's new or not to you. The only thing that matters to you is that you know you confessed your sin. And you know Jesus forgave you of your sin. And you know, according to the Word of God, your name has been written down. Yeah, right. Other than that, this other stuff doesn't matter right now. Right. It doesn't matter. You must join my church. I believe in joining church. But I'll tell you one thing, if you're not saved, don't join. Right. No business even applying for it. No, you're saved. Number three, I want you to notice not only the benefactors and the hope, but I want you to notice the ethics surrounding the basis of this record. I've spoken of it already. Say it briefly to you in Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Write it down in your notes because it's a great scripture. Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Thank God I don't have to worry about the wrath of hell if my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I don't even have to think about hell. And you know, folks, I don't say this to justify myself or to brag about my salvation. But St. Paul did it, and I think sometimes we need to do it. We need to stand up and say, I don't brag on myself. I brag on the work that Jesus did in me. Yeah. I know I'm saved. I'm not afraid of hell. I'll never see hell. I can't tell you about it because I'm never going to see it. Right. 
<laughs> you say, brother, you're pretty bold. I am bold in Jesus. I don't expect to see it. I don't know what it's going to look like, and I can care less what it looks like. The only thing my job is to share God's vivid description of what it looks like or what it's about. Other than that, I know nothing. Once you get there, and I say this with all, all respect this morning, and I hope nobody in this church faces this, you say, well, I'm a 40, 30, 20. I've been thinking about how many years I got to retirement. 14, 15, 20 years. 30. But if you want to retire at 62, I got 14 years. So I got 14 years. You don't have to worry about too much until about 62. I was looking at the the uh, the list on the TV this morning of those who had died in Pittsburgh. All the two, everyone that died was under the age of 62. A lot of people would say, well, I don't have to worry about nothing because I'm only 20 or 40 or 50. I want you to know that there are people that are going to pass away in the next second and never thought ever that it would be them. Are they going to be ready? Is their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? You say, Pastor, does this have anything to do with the church? No. And I hope nobody is offended by this. Nobody more than me wants to fill our church up and see people crowd in here. But I'll tell you this right now. Having your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life has nothing to do with a church name. It has nothing to do with a specific doctrine. It has to do with you getting your sins forgiven. That's flatly the truth. There is nothing more or nothing less. If we did nothing more for the rest of our days but preach Jesus saves, we fulfill the scripture. All right. Heaven's glory is promised only to those who have been washed in the blood. Number four and last this morning. The benefactors, the hope, the basis of this record. Now I want you to see the ethics surrounding the band. The band in this record. Those whose names are not written in this record will be banned from God's grace and God's glory. That means when their time of judgment comes, there is no second chance. There will be no grace for them. There will be no chance for them. You remember the, the man that wanted to go down and try to get his family when Jesus was giving the illustration about how he went to hell and, and uh, he looked over and the, the beggar was in Abraham's bosom across the chasm there. And he says, if you only send some folks back to my family, uh, do something. Uh, give me a little drop of water on my tongue. Do this and that. And, and, and you know, the, uh, the truth that Jesus was trying to bring across was this. After that's happened, there is no other change. There is no more communication. Can I put one more thing in without charging you? Thank you. Put these soothsayers and these crystal ball ladies and these Ouija boards and all this evil corruption out of your life. Amen. Because it has no place there. If you think that God's going to call or allow your soul to be called up out of hell until He calls it, you're thinking wrong. My Bible tells me at this resurrection in my text, that's when those who have died in their sin will be resurrected. Their spirits will come forth. And I'll tell you something. I don't care what they see. I don't care. If, there's, if there are ghosts, let them roam. Let them roam. I know there's demons. But listen to me. Those demons have no hold over me. Amen. You see, my name's not written in the book of Satan. My name's written 
in the book of life. Amen. He has no control over me mentally, physically, or emotionally. I am free, hallelujah, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. No detriment to myself, but a glory that comes from Him. Life eternal. I say to you this morning, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Jesus is able this second to give you the authority you need to know your sin. Amen. You're free. On every head bowed and every While the organist and pianists are coming this morning, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15 says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8 says, But the fearful, did you hear this? The unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I'm just going to ask you one question, one only this morning. This has been just an old-fashioned sermon. To make sure that we understand that when we leave this church this morning, we don't have any doubts. I'm right with God. You want to know how your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life? The Bible says, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. You walk to this altar and stand here and say, Jesus... I give my life to you unreservedly. Never going to take it back. Never going to take it back for any reason. It's yours. In that moment, 